Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here GMAT Review, the official guide, the 13th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The book contains 230 problem solving questions. It has 174 data sufficiency questions. We have already solved all the math problems from this book. If you are interested in watching any of the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Right now we are in the process of redoing the problems and we are on page number 291. Please turn to it. Page number 291, problem number 169 is what we are about to do. Problem number 169 on page 291. Problem 169 tells us that we have some number n which we are told is more than 0. Well, that's good to know. It is more than 0. It is a, po it is a positive number is what they are trying to say here. It's more than 0. I lost it here. That's not what it says here. 169 says n is a positive integer n is a positive integer. That's what I said. N, n, n is a positive integer. The question is, is, is 1 over 10 raised to n less than 0 0.01? That's the question here. And as always, as always, before we look at either of the two statements, it's always a good idea to understand and properly digest as to what is being told here. So let's simplify it. Let's analyze it a little bit before you worry about looking at the two statements. 0 0.01, 0 0.01 is same as 1 over 100. 0 0.01 is same as 1 over 100. 1 over 100. And 1 over 100 can be written as 1, 1 over 10 squared, which in turn can be written as 1 over 10 whole squared. So this thing is same as 1 over 10 whole squared. So far so good? Very good. And that in turn, that in turn, and this in turn can be written as 1 over 10 raised to n is same as 10 raised to negative 1 times n. You see it? And the question is, is that less than this quantity which can be written as 10 raised to negative 2? Obviously, 10 raised to negative 2 is 1 over 100 which is 0 0.01. Now we have the same base. We have a base of 10 here, we have a base of 10 here which means the exponents have to be equal to each other. This quantity has to equal to this quantity. And therefore, well not equal to rather, in this case, because the bases are the same, saying that 10 raised to this uh, negative n is that less than 10 raised to negative 2 is same as asking is negative n less than negative 2. Are you with me so far? Is negative n less than negative 2? If you multiply both sides of this inequality, by a negative 1, multiply this side by negative 1, and since, since we are multiplying by a negative number, the direction of the inequality, instead of being less than, it's going to switch. And now we have negative times negative is positive. The question, what it boils down to is, is n more than 2? That's what they're asking. What they're asking here is, is n more than 2? That's what they're asking here. Because if n happens to be more than 2, then this will be true. For example, for example, Let's look at here. Let's look at here. So let's, for example, if we had 1 over 10 raised to n. If n happens to be more than 2, if n happens to be more than 2, let's say if it's 3, then this is 1 over 1,000. And 1 over 1,000 is in fact less than 1 over 100. As you can see, that is true. 1 over 1,000, 1 over 1,000 is going to be less than 1 over 100 because n is more than 2. Now it doesn't have to be an integer. It could be two point, It could have been 2.1 or 2.5 or 2.001. As long as n is more than 2, as long as n is more than 2, this fraction is going to be smaller than that fraction. That's what it is. That's what we have to establish. Now we are ready to look at the two statements. If we just have to have sufficient data for us to be able to ascertain that n is in fact more than 2. Let's see what they tell us in the first statement. We need the room and I left no room for anything. Let's do it on the top. The first statement, let's see what it says. In the first statement, 
what? What do you know? In the first sentence that tell you that n is more than two, then we are done. That's it. The question is, is n more than two? To which they go on and answer in the first statement that n is in fact more than two. First statement does the job. Because what, what they're asking is what they're telling you right here. We can't get any easier than that. A, D, B, C, E. But you have to, what we have to understand here is that it would not have been this simple, it would not have been this simple and this straightforward had we not taken our time to analyze what it is that is being asked. You must simplify as much as you can. This is what they're asking in the, in the simplest form. This is what they're asking. They're asking us, is n more than 2? And then in the first statement, they go on and tell us that n is more than 2. Well, obviously, first statement by itself does the job quite nicely. Now that we established that the first statement by itself is enough, we know now, answer cannot be B, C, or E. We already have a 50% chance of getting this question right. We have a 50-50 chance, you understand? Let's look at second statement. In the second statement, they go on, tell us. Now, for second statement, actually, we do need the room, so we have to erase everything. Remember, this is what they're asking. What we're answering is this, what we question is this. Is n more than 2? That's what we're asking. Is n more than 2? That's what we're trying to answer. Let's look at second statement. As long as we can answer that question, either in affirmative or negative, we are done. And of course, of course, the answer is not going to be in negative. The answer is going to be in affirmative. And how do we know that the answer is going to be in affirmative? Because even though technically speaking, we are supposed to delete all the memory. We are supposed to erase everything from our memory. But we do know from the first statement that the first statement told us that n is more than 2. And they never contradict each other. Which means the second statement, if it, is, if it turns out to have enough information, if it turns out to have enough data for us to ascertain whether or not n is more than 2, then we know that the answer is going to be yes, it is more than 2. Do you understand? Let's do it. Or it turns out that maybe they don't provide enough data in the second statement, in which case the answer will remain A. In the second statement, they tell us that 1 over 10 raised to n minus 1 is less than 0.1. Again, the same thing is going to go on. 0.1 is same as 1 over 10, and which in turn is same as 10 raised to negative 1. 10 raised to negative 1. We have to bring this thing to 10. So same exact thing, that this 1 over 10 raised to this thing is same as 10 raised to negative 1 times n minus 1. Negative 1 times n minus 1. Is that less than 10 raised to negative 1? That's what they're asking. Which in turn, which is turn is same as asking, is this quantity less than negative 1? Is negative 1 times n minus 1 less than negative 1? We're going to do the same thing as always. We're going to get rid of this negative 1 by multiplying both sides of the inequality by a negative number. But remember, as soon as we multiply both sides of the inequality by a negative number, the direction of the inequality has to be switched. For example, we know 3 is less than 4. 3 is less than 4. But if you were to multiply both sides of the inequality by negative 2, then we know that negative 6 is in fact not less than negative 8. Negative 6 is in fact greater than negative 8. This is no longer true. Negative 8 is greater than negative 8. Negative 6 is greater than negative 8. The direction of the inequality has to be switched as, as soon as we multiply both sides of the inequality or if we divide both sides of the inequality by a negative number, as we always remind ourselves. So let's continue here. Enough of the talk. So let's multiply this side by negative 1. Let's multiply this side by negative 1 and let's multiply this side by negative 1. So that's it. This negative goes away. Negative times negative is positive. So the question is n minus 1. Oh. I shouldn't have done it here. Blast it. I should not have done it here. I'm going, to, I'm going to do it in the second step. I almost made the mistake, but I just told you here. So this is what we have here, n minus 1, n minus 1. I always make a point of rewriting the whole thing so that I remember to switch it. So we're going to multiply this side by negative 1. We're going to multiply this side by negative 1. And as a result, it's going to switch. The direction of the, direction of the inequality is going to switch from less than to greater than. Now this negative 1 and this negative 1 is just positive. So the question is, is n minus 1? What, what, what the second statement tells us is, it's not is, the second statement tells us that n minus 1 is greater than 1. Let's add 1 to both sides, and if we add 1 to both sides, what we find is that n is greater than 2. That's what we wanted to find out. Is n greater than 2? Second statement clearly tells us that it is indeed greater than 2. But one more time, as I always point out to you, and I should have done this from the very beginning, we don't have to do all of this thing. We simply have to understand that this inequality, the way it is presented to us, and let me put it in the red marker, demarcation around it. 
we have to be able to understand that if you look at this part here, there is no reason whatsoever, there is no reason whatsoever why we cannot make a determination about n. There has to be a value of n that we can find from here. It's a very simple inequality. This thing is 1 over 10, this is 1 over 10. We can find, we can find the, uh, the value of n very easily, which is exactly what we did here. What the value of the n turns out to be is not the point. The point is it is possible to figure out something distinct, something unique, something determinative, something definite about n. And as long as you can do that, then we can answer this question. Answer is going to be either yes or no, but we will be able to answer the question because we can tell something definitive about the n. We didn't actually have to do all of this thing. Do you understand? Let's go to the next one. Number 170. Number 170. You need the room and I need the break. Number 170. In number 170, we are told that n is a n is a positive integer. It is positive and it is a whole number. What is the question? The question is, what is the tens digit of n? What is the tens digit of n? For example, for example, right here, day number 358, day 358, the tens, tens digit is 5. 8 is the unit digit. This is the hundreds digit, hundreds digit. This is point, point 0.7. This is called, this is called the tenth digit, tenth. And had it been 7.358.7, 7 .7, then this would be called the hundredth digit with the th at the end, hundredth. Hundredth digit. This is hundredth digits, and this is tens digit. And the question here is, what is the tens digit of this quantity n? Let's see what they tell us about n, shall we? Sometimes I do to point out the bloody obvious because I have no way of knowing who you are. Do you understand? You might already know it, or you might uh, you might uh, forgotten it. Who knows? But these are not the kind of things we deal with every, in our every, everyday lives, do we? So first statement tells us that hundreds, 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 hundreds digit of a quantity which is 10 times n, 10 times n, is 6. What we want to find out is what's the tens digit of n. What they're telling us is that if you were to take the 10 times that quantity, whatever that quantity is, if you were to take the 10 times that quantity, then it turns out that the hundredths digit of that is 6. What do we gather from that? If the hundredths digit of a quantity which is 10 times the original quantity is 6, it only means one of two things. It only means one of two things. things. One, thing, one, one thing it means that Well, if the hundreds digit is 6, there are no possible possibilities. Actually, there are several possibilities. If the hundred digit is 6, which means that implies, that implies that the n that we're looking for, n has to be, n is, n is, has to be either 6, 60, 61, 62, all the way up to 69. Why all the way up to 69? n has to be one of these 10 numbers. Why? Because if it, if it, if it n turns out to be 60, then 60 times 10 is 600, in which case the hundreds digit, we are told hundreds digit of 10 times n is 6. As you can see, if we take, if n happens to be 60, 60 times 10 is 600, and the hundreds digit is 6. Maybe n is 62. 62 times 10 is going to be 620, and again hundreds digit is 6. Maybe n is 69. 69 times 10 is 690, and hundreds digit is again 6. But it has to be one of these 10 values. It has to be. N has to be. It N cannot be anything other than that. N has to be, given the fact that when you multiply N by 10, the hundredth digit of that product, 10 times N is 6. That tells us that N has to be 
60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, or 69. That's it. Those are the 10 possibilities. From our point of view, it really doesn't matter what n actually is, because the only thing that we want to be able to, only thing that we want to be able to answer is what's the tenth digit. It doesn't matter what the, what n is. It does not matter what value n is, whether it's 60 or 61 or 62 or 69. In all cases, the tenth digit is six. So, do we have enough information from the first statement to be able to answer the question here? Question here is what's the tenth digit of six? The answer is tenth digit of ten. What's the tenth digit of n? The answer is tenth digit of n is six. We are able to answer the question. The first statement does the job quite nicely. A, D, B, C, E. The first statement does the job quite nicely. Now that we have established that the first statement by itself is enough, we know now, answer cannot be B, C, or E. It would have to be either A or D. Let's look at second statement. In the second statement, they tell us that the tens digit of n plus 1 is 70. Well, if the tens digit of n plus 1, whatever this n is, if you were to add 1 to it, the tens digit of n plus 1, it's very difficult for, for tens digit to be, to be, to be 70. It's, it's 7. Is 7. The tens digit of n plus 1, whatever the n is, whatever the quantity n is, if you were to add 1 to it, the tens digit is 70. Well, there are two possibilities. One possibility is that maybe n is equal to 69. n is equal to 69, in which case n plus 1 would be 70, and tens digit, tens digit of n plus 1 is 7, right here. Or maybe n is not 69, maybe n is Maybe n is uh, 70 or 71 or 72, 73 or maybe all the way up to 78. It cannot be 79. n cannot be 79 because if, if, if n were 79 and if you were to add 1 to it, it will become 80. It will become 80 and the tenth digit of n plus 1, 10 plus n plus 1 in this case would be 8. We are told that the tenth digit of n plus 1 is 7 which means we must stop at 78. But the point here is that those are possible. This n could be anywhere from 70 to 78. Now, if n happens to be one of these numbers, if n happens to be either 70 or 71 or 72 or all the way up to 78, in all of these cases, the tens digit is 7. But if n turns out to be this guy, if n turns out to be exactly 69, then n plus 1 is 70, the tens digit is, we did meet that condition, we, we did meet the condition in what is stated in the second statement, second statement tells us that the tens digit of n plus 1 is 7, tens digit of n plus 1 is 7, but in which case n is 69, in which case tens digit is 6. So if n happens to be 69, 10 digit is going to be 6, if n happens to be one of these, if n happens to be one of these, the tens digit is going to be 7. Are we able to answer this question definitively? What is the tens digit of 7? The answer is no. We don't know. It could be either 6 or 7. The tens digit of n could be either 6 or 7, depending on whether n is 69 or whether n is anywhere from 70 to 78. The second statement does not do the job. Second statement is not enough. And therefore, the answer to this question is A. Let's go on the next one, number 171. Number 171. I need my break as usual. Number 171. Question is, what's the value of value of 2t plus t minus x over t minus x. That's what we're looking for. Again, before we look at the before we look at the uh, information that is given in the two statements, it's always a good idea to take a take a couple of moments and digest this thing that is that is being told to us. Let's analyze it, let's digest it, let's understand it, let's extract as much information out of it as we can. Because right now it's sitting in a pretty ugly form, isn't it? 
Let's see what we can do. Well, we see t minus x at the bottom. Do you see t minus x on the top? So that's what we have to do. So this thing can be written as 2t over t minus x, 2t over t minus x, and then plus t minus x plus uh, over t minus x. Are you able to see that? It can be written like this because that's what it is. Which in turn can be written as 2t over t minus x plus 1. So that's what the question is asking. Question is asking, the question is asking us how much is 2t plus t minus x plus 1. That's what the question is. That's what we have to answer. Now we are ready to look at the first statement. What we have to figure out is the value of this quantity, 2t over t minus x. That's what we have to find out. And then of course we just simply add 1 to it and we can answer the question that is being asked. Let's see what they tell us in the first statement, shall we? We need the room, we need to erase this thing. In the first statement, oh, what do you know? Isn't that spooky? Almost gives you a goosebump, doesn't it? Yes, I know. They tell us that this bloody thing is 3. Well, if that bloody thing is 3, then what they're asking here is equal to 4. The first statement does the job quite beautifully. A, D, B, C, E. A, D, B, C, E. Now that we established that the first statement by itself is enough, we know now, answer cannot be B, C, or E. Answer has to be either A or D. Let's look at second statement. In the second statement, they tell us that t minus x equals 5. t minus x equals 5. Do you see a problem? If t minus x equals 5, we put it in here, what we get is 2t over t minus x, which we, which we are told is 5, plus 1, plus 1. Question is, how much is that quantity? Can we answer that question? Can we answer that question, how much is that quantity? Clearly not. Clearly not, because we do not know what t is. There is no way to figure out the value of t from the second statement. Until we know the value of t, we cannot figure out what 2t, 2t over 5 is. Second statement does not do the job. Second statement is not enough by itself. Therefore, the answer to this question is a. That's it. We are in the final stretch. We have three more problems to go in the data sufficiency, which we're going to do in the next video, which is going to be the last video of the data sufficiency, day number 360. Okay? I'll see you tomorrow. Bye now.